So I started to ask myself, wait a minute, God, are you responsible for David losing his fire? Mm. The Bible clearly says that he goes to Gath because he's tired mm. from running from Saul. And we just found out in these two scriptures that the evil spirit came, well, got permission from the Lord. So I said, Lord, hold on a second. Is it your fault now mm. <laughs> that David has lost his fire? I'm Dean Cullinane, and you're listening to Why They Did That, a show that explores the motivations of biblical characters and how their choices can guide yours. Joining me in this episode is a man that I have a great deal of admiration for. Why? Well, first of all, he's married with four daughters, but mostly because his enthusiasm for the Word of God is quite frankly contagious. His name is Adam Patel, and I'd love to tell you more about him, where his passion comes from, why he has an Islamic last name, and how he overcame a life that involved moving from the United States to the United Kingdom to Saudi Arabia and then India. But We may or may not have another episode coming up with him in the future. One thing you will notice immediately, though, is that Adam is on fire for God. In this episode, we're actually going to revisit a character that we've done before, David. Except instead of looking at a time in his life when he's playing music for the king, we head to 1 Samuel chapter 27, where David is on the run. Except this time, he ends up running to the enemy. That's right. This is the story of David, the Lord's anointed, running to the Philistine camp for refuge. When I first gave my heart to the Lord Mm -hmm. and I was on fire for God, I would like to believe that I still am. (laughs) But I remember, you know, I was really bold and and I gave my testimony at church one day. And when I got done giving my testimony, Mm. this older gentleman came up to me and he said, wow, that was powerful. Right. I remember what it used to be like to be on fire for the Lord. Mm. And the way he said it was as if he missed being on fire for the Lord. Yeah. And he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, but you'll see over time. And he hung his head and he walked out the sanctuary. And I never forget that, Mm. that experience. Cause I told the Lord, I don't want to be like that. Mm. I don't want to lose my fire. And I began to pray for the guy. I felt so sorry for him. But at the same time I was concerned. I was like, I don't want to eventually die out. You know, I had literally the same experience. Really? Except, (laughs) or not literally the same, but um, I remember my wife and I went to a friend's wedding Mm -hmm. and we were married for maybe two months, Mm -hmm. three months. And so we got there and, you know, you're kind of just mingling because a lot of people at weddings that you just don't know. And our friends had a much larger friend circle than we even knew. So we're seeing a lot of people for the first time. Anyways, um, this person comes up to us. I don't remember if they were a a man or woman, Mm -hmm. but they come up to us and I remember the conversation so vividly. So I said, hey, so how do you know, the, you know, so-and-so? And we told them, like, so are you two married? It's like, yeah. Like, you look really young. My wife and I got married when I was 22. She mm-hmm. was 20. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and we were like, yeah, we got married three months ago. And they were like, well, how, how is it? And we're like, it's amazing. Yeah. It's great. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's everything we wanted and so much more. Praise the Lord. And she looked at us and she, oh, I guess it was a woman, <laughs> looked at us and said, oh, that's amazing. I remember when I just got married mm-hmm. and I was like, okay. She's like, yeah, you know, we all go through that honeymoon phase, mm-hmm. um, but eventually you'll see what marriage is really like. And then walked away. Wow. And my wife and I looked at each other like, 
snap. Great encouragement. Yeah, like, is this just a temporary thing? Like, do we have to just have this this high and then we're destined to experience this wow. discouraging low? And that, that, like you said, that stuck with me forever. I remember that vividly. That's powerful because marriage is identical to what our relationship with yeah. God should be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And our, our love relationship with our spouses mm -hmm. should never die. Exactly. If, if, if anything, it should grow. Yeah, and I remember thinking to myself after the day after I got married, because mm -hmm. everyone talks, there's so much emphasis put on the, the wedding day. Yeah. You know, my wife and I were very, very um, focused in that. We were like, the day is just a day. It's one single day, it's 24 hours, and then we've got to be married, you know, so we can't be having like Amen. a $20,000 wedding and then a, a, a $100 home. <laughs> Praise the Lord for that. But it was, it was very apparent to us that that focus needed to be on the future, not just here. And the thought just came to me that, you know, your wedding day, and I think this relates same to the experience that we have when we find the Lord, your wedding day is meant to be the worst day of your marriage. Mm. Mm. Because each day should get better from better that point. That. Now we look back at this wedding day experience or this baptismal experience as though it is meant to be the highlight. You know, you look, you like, remember that day. Yeah. When yeah. it's like, really, that day was the day when we knew the Lord the least, or that's the day when we, Amen. you know, Amen. didn't really know our spouse compared to how we know them Amen. now. Amen. And the experience should have got sweeter. Absolutely. We've literally got it the other way around. Absolutely. That's a wonderful point. You know what? Spending thousands of dollars, that's a bad day every day for me, you know? <laughs> yes. So um, this is why this story really grips my attention because mm -hmm. 10 chapters prior, mm -hmm. In 1 Samuel 17, David is on fire. Yeah. Now, I, it's not an accident that a, out of all the cities he could be running to for help, mm -hmm. it's Gath. Right. And we know that when he first comes on the scene, he's this young man mm -hmm. and he's so bold. Yeah. And no one else wants to stand up to Goliath. And he's like, who's this uncircumcised Philistine? Yes. Right. And then when he faces Goliath, it's like the Bible blows me away because David's really talking to the giant. Like, mm -hmm. I'm going to take your head off. Yeah. I'm going to feed you to the birds. And then the Bible says something amazing that when it's time to fight, David runs to him. Yeah. It's not David like, is the giant in David the story. David is the giant. Yeah. <laughs> and this guy was so on fire for the cause of God mm. and that he didn't want to do, he didn't want to compromise in any way with sinners. He wanted to show that, hey, my God can defeat any situation, mm. you know? And so when I look at this story, I almost asked the question, well, I do ask the question, who is this guy? It seems like a complete, yeah. this seems like a defeated person. I see this guy walking with his head down, like kicking rocks, totally defeated. Mm. And I'm saying to myself, what in the world happened to David? Mm. What would bring somebody to this point? What makes a Christian, you know, say the things that the guy said to me or the, or the, the woman who said that about your relationship? Mm -hmm. what, what brings our love relationship with Christ down where you lose that first love mm -hmm. that Christ spoke of in Revelation uh, chapter two, mm -hmm. Ephesus? I, I don't know about you, but this was one of my worst fears when I first gave my heart to the Lord. I, 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 and so when I look at this story, I've come to understand what brought David to this point. Mm. Um, I had to go back, you know, and I, and I go back to 1 Samuel 18. Um, of what started it, what brings him to that point. Mm -hmm. Because David now in 1 Samuel 27, He's doing the thing that you would never expect him to do. He's running to the enemy. Running to the enemy. Not to defeat them, mm -hmm. to join them. Yeah. And in the story where he runs to the enemy, what's mind blowing is he tells the king of Gath that I'm willing to be your servant. The crazy thing is, it's like, you know, when we look at the scriptures, we rarely, at least, if you grew up in the church mm -hmm. or you've been there for, you know, a substantial amount of time, mm -hmm. you don't really get hit by the newness of the stories. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I wasn't brought up in the faith, but I don't remember the first time I read about Adam and Eve. 
Yeah. I don't remember the first time that I heard the story of Noah and the ark. It's almost as if you've just always known it. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of difficult because you come to the scriptures. For example, you look at the gospels. And, and in fact, the gospels do this themselves. When they're introducing the disciples, they're like, you know, here's such and such, such and such, such and such. And Judas who would betray Jesus. Mm -hmm. you know, they, they give away the end before you before you get there at all. Absolutely. And it's kind of like when we come to the scriptures, there's not the, the like it's, like I said, unless you come to it for the first time, you don't have this what happens next yeah. kind of question because you know the story. But if we didn't know the story, and we were reading this for the first time. And I try and I try and, you know, pray for the Lord to, to help me read the Bible as though I'm reading it for the first time. Yeah. You're back in First Samuel 17, you're learning about this young king who's who's faithfully doing his little work, looking after his sheep, but he's he's being propelled into the king's courts, he's being used in mighty ways. You could not, I don't care how, you know how good you are at judging where people's lives are going to yeah. go. You can never put David, if you're reading 1 Samuel 17, where he ends up in 1 Samuel 27. You don't see this young man that's on fire for the Lord yeah. running, yeah. Not, not falling and ending up with the end, but running to the enemy for assistance. You just, you can't predict that. You, you can't, you can't. I think it's a testimony to the nature of man, mm. you know, and we can't even predict our own lives. Right. I've done things, man, in my life that, you know, before I did it, many years before I did it, I would never do never. that. Right. You're crazy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, before I got into sin and smoking and drugs, I would never smoke cigarettes. I right. would never drink. But I found myself doing that uh -huh. and worse. Right. You know, um, it really speaks to the power or the, mm -hmm. or the truth that we have no power. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We have no power. So I, I, I see this guy, David, he's on fire. But he ends up 10 chapters later living this complete compromised life. Mm -hmm. He's a defeated, what I call a defeated, deflated Christian. Mm. His flame is almost completely blown out. And so I wanted to understand, Lord, how in the world did he get to this point? Mm -hmm. Because you have this story in here to help us not to get to the same point. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so I, I look, I backtrack to where he was on fire in 1 Samuel 17. Mm -hmm. And then I notice something occurring in the chapters after. Mm -hmm. Saul gets jealous and the king is hunting this guy down. Yeah. I mean, David can't catch a break. Mm -hmm. And it's nonstop, the relentless pursuit. He's running into the woods. He's hiding in the caves. He's ducking and dodging. He's it's a living. nationwide game of cat and mouse. Come on now. He's living on the run. And it's as if this persecution, this heat on his back, mm. wore him out. Um, one thing that really caught my attention as I began to read is in 1 Samuel 18 and verse 9. David, after he kills Goliath, he is demolishing the Philistines. Mm -hmm. He's so famous. Remember the song the women are yep. singing? Saul has killed... His thousands, but David, his tens of thousands. So think about this. The Philistines were a pagan heathen nation, mm -hmm. which I see as the enemies of God. Right. Right. For sure. So he was putting a dent on the enemies of God. He was destroying that which Satan was trying to rise up right. to destroy. Gates of hell shall not prevail. Come on now. Mm -hmm. David was a mighty man of God that was taking taking it hard to the kingdom of darkness. So if I were the devil and I see this young guy destroying my kingdom, mm -hmm. I'm going to want to take him out. Right, sure. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, hey, this guy's got to go. Mm -hmm. he's, he's, he's doing too much damage to my kingdom, right? And so what I noticed that's, that's really peculiar about the persecution that David faces, who it's ultimately from. Mm. Notice what it says in 1 Samuel 18, verse 9. And Saul I David from that day forward. He was jealous because the, the women were singing the song. But who was really I and David? Was it really Saul? Mm. The Bible says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Flesh and blood. And in 1 Samuel 16, when David, I believe, was anointed, the Bible clearly says that the Spirit of God left Saul and an evil spirit came upon him. Mm -hmm. So when I see the scripture saying Saul I David, 
I have to see it as the Bible tells me to see it, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, yeah. that it wasn't really Saul that was I and David, it was Satan. So Saul is the, he's the figurehead yeah. for the devil in this story. Absolutely. So we can essentially, when reading the story, we can take Saul out of it and put, put the devil in. Absolutely. We can read it like that. Absolutely. You know, in our relationships with people, you know, <laughs> that's what we should do. Mm. We, should, we should look at the supernatural you know, and if we did that, you know, and I'm going to be bold to even say if we did that at home mm. in our relationships with our spouses, even. Right. Um, we always have to look at the supernatural and this will really take out personal feelings and, and, and you feeling personally offended by people. If you take that out of the equation and mm. look at things the way Jesus asks us to look at it. It's funny you say that because what's come to my mind is where Jesus rebukes Peter. Yeah. You know, and he said he looks at Peter, who you could, you know, arguably maybe John, but Peter's up there with being Jesus' best friend. Absolutely. And Jesus looks at him and says, Get behind me, Satan. Satan. And people I I mean, if you know, if I said that's Christian, for example, um, you you can take you can take personal offense from that. Yeah. But really, Jesus is looking at Peter and saying, Okay, yes, something has been done to allow the devil in. Yeah. But I can see past the human aspect here. Absolutely. Like this is, as you said, this is not flesh and blood. This is, this is the powers of spiritual darkness here trying to, trying to get through and, and discourage Absolutely. this young man. Absolutely. You know, I got kids mm -hmm. and, and nobody can pull out the old man mm. better than my kids <laughs> or, or my wife. Mm. The people in my own home are the best at pulling out the flesh, mm. you know? Yeah. And so if I get the victory at home, hmm. I'm on my way to the kingdom. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Praise God for family. That's right? it. Now, brother, I don't recommend we, you know, tell our wives, get the behind me. <laughs> <laughs> you know? We might but, be seeing the kingdom very soon after yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But but I do recommend still having an understanding mm -hmm. of the spiritual and, and being able to pray. Yeah. When you notice what's going on. Mm -hmm. So here in the story, you see Saul, I and David. Notice what the next verse says. First Samuel 18, verse 10. And it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from whom? From God. From God came upon Saul and he prophesied in the midst of the house and David played with his hand as at other times and there was a javelin in Saul's hand. And Saul cast a javelin for he said, I will smite David even to the wall with it and David avoided out of his presence twice. Mm. So my question is, who's really throwing the javelin? Is it Saul? Well, it says that the evil spirit came from God. Wow. This is, okay. I, sometimes you read the Bible and you, uh, I don't know if the Bible really meant to say that, you right. know? <laughs> Typo. <laughs> but then it comes up again. Uh -huh. Let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 19 and verse 9. Now, mm -hmm. this is the second time Saul throws the spear. Right. Notice what it says. And the evil spirit from who? From the Lord. From the Lord was upon Saul. Now, let me make it plain. Yeah, so what's the saying? Is this, is God, God's trying to take out David now? Well, that's why I want to correct it. It's obvious that Saul was influenced by an evil spirit. Mm -hmm. It's obvious that the evil spirit was the one who influenced Saul to pick up the spear. So mm -hmm. in essence, it was Satan who was bringing on the heat, mm -hmm. throwing the dart, Mm -hmm. throwing the javelin or shooting the arrow, whatever you want right, to say, right. at David. But the Bible's clear. We got two witnesses here mm -hmm. that the evil spirit came from the Lord. What do, what do you mean came from the Lord? Or maybe received permission mm -hmm. from the Lord. So what you're saying is essentially God is using Satan almost as his weapon. Absolutely. You know, there's a really strange story in 1 Kings 22. Mm -hmm. um, there's a prophet. People call him prophet number 401 because Ahab and Jehoshaphat are talking about going to battle. And Ahab brings 400 prophets. And they're like, yeah, go to battle. You're going to be all right. Mm -hmm. And one prophet comes. I think it's Micaiah. Mm -hmm. He comes and he prophesies the truth that if you go to battle, you're going to die. And he tells Ahab and Jehoshaphat that he has this vision 
and he sees in heaven God on his throne mm. and he has the host of heaven about him and he asks who's going to be a lying spirit and be a, become a lying spirit to those 400 false prophets and an angel comes up and says I will and the Lord sends him to be a lying spirit that tells me that God will use an evil angel to fulfill at times his ultimate purpose. Hmm. That, that's, that's hard for me to say. Man. Right, right, right. I don't even feel right saying that, to be <laughs> honest with you. But how could, we, how could we explain these scriptures where the evil spirit comes from God? Hmm. I'm reminded of Job. Right. Job was a man that feared the Lord. Satan comes and God and Satan have this conversation. What are you doing? Walking to and fro the earth. Have you considered my certain servant Job? Mm. And basically, it's like God and Satan have this competition. And Satan says, well, he only loves you because you have a hedge around of protection him. around him. Mm -hmm. But remove that hedge. And God says, okay, you can touch his stuff, but don't touch him. Mm -hmm. It's a powerful story. It really illustrates to you and I that Satan can't just bring trial or throw javelins or shoot arrows at us mm. without permission. But this is a little more than permission though, right? right? This is God using it. So it's 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 almost as if, you know, Satan, there's no doubt that Satan wants David dead. Yeah. You know, we've made that point. God is using then Satan's, you know, his desires, the way that he's going to manipulate and use Saul. God is is even through that going to make a way to highlight who he is in David's life. Amazing. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. he's using this experience of Satan trying to, he's tricked Satan in a sense. Yeah. Where Satan's like, I'm going to, I'm going to take this out. And God's like, I'm going to use your efforts to take him out, to make him stronger. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. It's, you know, <laughs> it's mind blowing how God is the architect the absolute genius where he's able to use the enemy as a benefit. That's mind blowing, right? Yeah. I, I can't even put my, wrap my mind around it, but Satan is so twisted in his nature. He's willing to bet that God is going to come out wrong in the end. And God is saying, I'm all knowing. I'm going to allow you certain liberties, but I'm going to allow you to do your dastardly deeds but in the end it's going to work out to my glory amazing to me you know that he that he allows that to happen so i started to ask myself wait a minute god are you responsible for david losing his fire mm. because the brother gets to first samuel chapter 27 and he's given up he's going to gath he's the bible clearly says that he goes to gath because he's tired mm. from running from Saul. And we just found out in these two scriptures that the evil spirit came, well, got permission from the Lord. So I said, Lord, hold on a second. Is it your fault now mm. <laughs> that David has lost his fire? He may be on the enemy's side, but David isn't going to war against God himself. He's lost his fire, yes. He's lost his focus. And now his chief interest is survival. You might be wondering, how will God get him out of this mess? One word, trials. Stay with us. I'm Dean Cullinane, and you're listening to Why They Did That. A Christian without a Bible is like a soldier without a sword. You can't expect to win the battle like that. So we'd like to introduce you to Humble Lamb Bibles. They make wonderfully crafted premium Bibles filled with cross-references, beautiful annotations, and many more built-in study tools. And catch this, this is just wonderful. For every Bible they sell, they give another Bible away for free to those in need. 
You can get another 10% off your purchase if you use the WTDT promo code when you check out in their store. So visit HumbleLamb.com and get yours now. His life is constantly at risk, but this time he's gone to the enemy side. We've gone from the man who, when God's army was standing still, he ran in front of them and took Goliath's head straight off to a man that is now wearing the color of the rival team. And his fire is all but gone. I want to read uh, 1 Samuel chapter 29, verses 1 and 2. Notice what the Bible says. Now the Philistines gathered together all their armies to Aphek, and the Israelites pitched by a fountain which is in Jezreel. And the lords of the Philistines passed on by hundreds and by thousands, but David and his men passed on in the rearward with a quiche. I mean, we've talked about you know, how a man can fall so far. Yeah. David is he's in this position now because the trials have come. Yeah. Saul has time after time tried to take his life. He's trying to be faithful. Yeah. You know, even in this, even in running to the Philistines, you can see where his heart still is. Yeah. He still wants to follow the Lord. He's yeah. making mistakes, no doubt. But he's like, I need to survive because, you know, God said he's going to do et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But we've gone from looking at the man who, when God's army was scared, mm. he ran in front of them. Mm. You know, he said, if you're not going to do anything about this giant, I'll take him out. Yeah. I'm not going to listen to anyone mock the Lord. Yeah. We pick up here in 1 Samuel 29, and it says at the end of verse 2 that he's essentially on the back line of the Philistine army now. Wow. And we don't look at this part of David, really. Mm -mm. I mean, if, if any aspect of David's life is glossed over, it's this. Yeah. Because when do we talk about David lining up with the <laughs> Philistines at the back, at mind the back. you? Yeah. Doesn't he, he doesn't really want to be in there. Yeah. But, you know, he's wearing the Philistine colors. Yeah. And he's going to war against God's people. It's an amazing thought, you know? to where a Christian can end up. Hmm. You know, I look at this story and I'm like, I'm thinking this is, this is us Christians. You know, we, we're human just like David, you know, and we can find ourselves, you know, in a total opposite position of where we started. Hmm. And it's amazing to me that this guy is in the back with the Philistines. Well, like you said, he started in the front leading God's armies. Hmm. I, I look at 1 Samuel chapter 28, uh, actually 27, and this life of compromise, it's really ironic that he's trying to run away from these trials and he ends up getting into more trials, mm, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> more trouble that, that God in his mercy is getting him out of. He ends up in this town called Ziklag. Mm -hmm. And Ziklag is, was, it's, you know, I looked it up where, where you know, in these, the Bible maps, where is Ziklag? And Ziklag is literally on the border between the lands of the Philistines and the land of Judah. Hmm. And I thought to myself, that is crazy. It's as if he had one foot in right. Philistia and one foot in Judah. The irony. He probably could have really did that. Yeah, yeah. Right? And, and he's telling Akish that, look, I'm going to protect your border and fight my own people. But then in reality, he was fighting the enemies of God. Mm -hmm. So here's this guy, one foot in Philistia, one foot in Judah, living this double life. In his heart, he wants to serve the Lord. But he's standing in the back with the Philistines in their armies, getting ready to fight Saul. Mm -hmm. And this is screaming to me the condition of God's church today. And even maybe some of us today. Mm -hmm. You know, Revelation 3 describes us as being Laodicea, mm -hmm. lukewarm. And the thing with David is, you know, this is not a, you know, this is not an unknown character. Mm -mm. Everyone in Judah knows David. Yes. By this point. He is the champion. Yes. Now, what they might not know is that he's standing on the other side. Wow. They don't necessarily know that he, they know he's on the run. You know, they know they haven't seen him yeah. around for a while. They know that Saul's gone a bit berserk, but they don't necessarily know that David is here standing against God's people. Yeah. And for me, you know, what comes to mind is just really how 
when you think of this man, you think the man after God's own heart. Yeah. And you think of the future king of Israel, the one that's going to, if you're looking at an Old Testament character that you can relate most closely to Jesus, David's top of that list. Yeah. But people don't know that he's on the other side. Yeah. And it's it's become, especially in today's world, especially with with all of the temptations that are around us, mm -hmm. it's become easy to claim the name of Jesus, claim the name of Christ, yeah. but secretly be living that life where no one really knows, but we're on the opposite team. Yeah. You think of how 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 technology has allowed us because we, we always talk about technology as being you know kind of all seeing mm -hmm. you can't escape but really what it's done is it's made everything you know a little bit more personal a little bit more hidden secretive you're yeah you're allowed to do things now that no one would ever know you, th you think think about think about and this is this is a crude example but i heard someone talking about this last week in england at least i don't know how it is in the united states um, you go into a, a store, mm -hmm. like a convenience store, a grocery store, and you'd have magazines kind of lined up. And they would put the explicit magazines on mm -hmm. the top shelf. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to go and buy one of those, you had to walk into the store. Mm -hmm. You had to now look at the, the shelf and people would be there like, you know, the shopkeeper yeah, yeah. is looking at you. What's he going to get? Yeah. And then, you know. It's not going to be a secret. Yeah, he's going he's gonna to look up. <laughs> And they, they see him reaching and he's, yeah. he's reaching higher and like, oh, and then you have to take it down. You have to walk, yeah. you know, to the front of the, the store. Scene. Yeah. You have to put it down. You know, the shopkeeper looks at you. Yeah. Looks down at the magazine, looks back up at you. Like, okay. Yep. Now. Yeah. No one needs to know. But here's the truth, right? That's a powerful point. And it was probably good for a lot of God's people that they didn't know. Mm. But somebody will always know. That's right. Not just God, mm -hmm. but your family will know. Mm. You know, if you have kids in the house, mm -hmm. if you have a spouse mm. and you're living a life of compromise, they will yeah, know. They'll see it. They'll see it. You mm -hmm. can't hide it from them. And what's amazing about this story is that David had some close friends. Mm. And when we get to 1 Samuel chapter 30, they had enough of him. They wanted to stone him. Yeah, they were going to turn. Right? Because of the decisions that he was making. It, it was as if, you know, they knew the, the type of life that where he ended up, you know? And the most important thing is God knows. We know that. Yeah. And no matter what decision you try to make, if you're doing godly things one day, you're going to church, you're reading the Bible, you're praying, but maybe the very next hour you're watching rated r movies mm. that's one foot in the church one foot in the world yeah that's the type of life that david is living here right it's a double life and jesus says no man can serve two masters and that's where we get this lukewarm terminology exactly a little hot a little cold yeah and jesus says that makes him sick makes him want to throw up right and god is calling us out right now mm if we're living like David in this situation, you know? And I think God is so merciful that he never lets us truly get away with our hypocrisy. Like mm -hmm. I mentioned before, there's always somebody that will know for sure if you are walking that straight or narrow, you know, that will keep you honest. Mm -hmm. And I think God designs it that way so we can always be closer to him right. and get our lives in order. Um, very, very, very powerful story. One thing I do see in all of this, though, is the mercy of God. Mm. You know, David was getting himself into trouble. He's, he's now behind the enemy, getting ready to fight Saul. What kind of a situation is that? I'm sure he, he, he's thinking to himself, to himself, how in the world am I going to get out of this one? Right. But God, even when he's making a mistake is working out a way for David to get out of the jam that he put himself in. Mm. You know, the story that the Philistine lords look at David and say to Akish, what is he doing here? Right. Why is David fighting with us? And they, they, they say, this is the one that killed Goliath. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 
that's amazing to me because think about how much dishonor David brought to the Lord. Mm. Yeah, I think about, you know, my Christian walk or maybe your Christian walk. Whenever we make a move that compromises, we bring dishonor to God's name. Mm. We actually hurt somebody's faith in the living God. Mm. You know, we're supposed to be examples that there is a God who saves. Our God is powerful. Our God is the best. Mm. He's loving. He's kind. But when we make compromises, we contradict that message. Mm. We send a completely different message to the world and it destroys their faith. Yeah. Why would they want to believe in a God that can't even manifest his lovely character in a so-called Christian mm. to keep him straight on the straight and narrow, especially if somebody has been on fire for the Lord. And I'm sure you've heard of many stories of ministers who have started off doing a wonderful work. And then all of a sudden they get caught up in some kind of controversy. controversy. Or mm. How much shame does that bring to the church and to the name of the Lord? But despite it all, God's merciful and he's working on our behalf uh, despite the decisions that we make that go against his kingdom and put his name down. And what's interesting is, at, you know, by this point in the story, Saul's not chasing him anymore. Yeah. You know, he's kind of just, he's left him alone. Yeah. Yeah. You know, in 1 Samuel 27, that really stuck out to me. It says, and it was told Saul that David was fled to Gath and he sought no more again for him. Hmm. Amazing to me that he's pursuing David as long as David is sold out for God. Hmm. Yeah. But as soon as David starts to make this compromise, Saul says, I have no need or reason to chase him. Now, if we're looking at this through the eyes of the spirit, we understand that Saul represents Satan. Mm -hmm. When you and I choose to live a life of compromise, Satan is saying, you know what? I have no reason to chase him anymore. And the thing, the thing that's always gripped me is I think that Satan prefers a Christian in the state of compromise than in the state of apostasy. Wow. Satan would rather you be in a place where you can influence God's people. There you go. And, and pull them away with you than you just outright left. Absolutely. You know, you see, you, you mentioned, you know, we, we hear all the time, unfortunately, of, you know, prominent Christians, if you will. And they walk away and a lot of people, they see that and it kind of spurs them on. Yeah. I'm not going to be like that. Yeah. It's become public and, and so on and so forth. But it's those creeping compromises where the person hasn't left, but their influence yeah. is attaching others to them so that when the day comes when they do leave, they don't leave alone. Yeah. And I think that Satan right now has David exactly what he wants. He doesn't need to chase him because he's got him. This is powerful because a lukewarm Christian is more dangerous than the worldling. Yeah. That's what this is for saying. Sure, for That's sure. mind blowing. Because mm. when I was in the world, I influenced a lot of people to do sin. Right. And there's people today that are still doing sin because of it. Yeah. Because of it. But if I'm a lukewarm Christian, hey man, I go to church, I pray, I teach, mm. but I live a totally different lifestyle with the secret on my secrecy on my phone or or the things I'm watching in on the TV in my yeah. room. Mm -hmm. That person is more dangerous. And here and this story illustrates it yeah, all. No, 100%. Because David now, if God would have allowed him to fight with the Philistines against King Saul, what would that have done mm. to his future and him receiving the crown? Mm. There's no way. Yeah he would have been king of Israel or Judah. Mm -hmm. The people would have looked at him as a traitor. Plus you can't commit treason and then lead the nation. You can't do it. But that's what the double lifestyle was leading towards. Him losing his crown and the people losing faith, not only in David, but in God, because David was God's anointed. Mm. Another thing that really screams, this story screams is that the Philistines feared David more than Saul. Yeah. 
They knew that David was the giant killer. Even on their own team. Yeah. On their own team. They even quoted it in 1 Samuel 29, the reason why the Philistines say, send him home. They said, this is the same guy. You remember that famous song? It spread throughout all the lands of yeah. the Philistines. This is the same guy that, that slew 10,000 of mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. Get him out of here. He's dangerous. But now think about it now. With him living a life of compromise, with David living a life of compromise, the Philistines now understood that one of God's strongest weapons is now taking off, taken off the battlefield. Mm. This made the church or Israel weaker mm. in the sight of the enemy. They were more emboldened now mm. to destroy God's people because a man was that was on fire is now living a life of compromise. So we can go on and on and see how dangerous and how much of an impact it makes when you and I decide to live a life of compromise. Mm -hmm. We not only hurt ourselves and, and, and put ourselves at risk of losing the crown, but we're putting the church, we're putting our families at risk. What grips me about all of this is it's David's reaction to his trials yeah. that has caused him to get to this point. Yeah. And so God in his infinite wisdom yes. says, what I need to relight the fire in this young man Come on now. is more trials. Come on now. God, God is <laughs> in his wisdom. Hmm. So you know what it reminds me of is, okay, so why is God allowed on this fire to come on David? Hmm. Why is he allowing? It reminds me of the verse in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 7, that describes what trials are all about. Mm -hmm. You know the verse, it says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory mm. at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Powerful verse. Yeah. It, it's telling us that the trials are being compared to fire mm -hmm. and that the fire or the trials are necessary to produce a faith in Christ that prepares somebody for the coming of the Lord. I don't know about you, but I want to be ready for the coming of the yeah. Lord. Revelation chapter three, in speaking of the lukewarm people, mm -hmm. those people who are acting like David in this story, Jesus is pleading with the Laodiceans, with the people in Ziklag, like David, living the double life. He says in Revelation 3, verse 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold mm. tried in the fire. Tried in the fire. We just read that in 1 Peter. You know, this is, this, is, this is Christians who go through persecution, Christians who go through tribulation, Christians who go through trial. Watch what God says. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. Mm. So I asked the Lord, I said, okay, wait a second. You're telling me that you allow Satan to persecute us, to bring trials on us so that we can gain a, an experience of faith and become rich. Mm. Rich in what? Yeah, what's the rich? Colossians 1 verse 27 makes it clear what the riches are to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Here's the riches, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Mm. Beautiful. So essentially what you're saying is that God sends these, these fiery trials, if yes. you will, because that's really the only way to get that hope of glory, to get Jesus Christ in us. Absolutely. Hmm. He says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. Yeah. Now these riches is Christ living in us, hmm. which tells us that you and I can only develop a Christ-like spirit if we go through trial. And how can we go through trials if we're sitting in the enemy's side? Come on. Come on. Mm. And how could we go through trial without Jesus living in us, right? Right, right. <laughs> Here's one scripture that comes to mind that kind of brings it all together, what God was doing with David. Mm -hmm. It's in the book of James, 
It's one of my favorite scriptures. James chapter 1, mm. verse yes. 12. Yes. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, mm. which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Man, I got goosebumps, mm. man. You don't get the crown unless you go through the fire. David was anointed king as a young man. Yeah. But there was a reason God didn't give him the throne. Mm. He wasn't ready for the crown. See, the crown is made out of pure gold. And you and I know that the only way to get pure gold is for the gold to be purged mm. or tried in the fire. And so David was anointed king. You and I, God says, when, when you give your heart to me, I'm anointing you king. But you have to go through a purging to be prepared to rule as a king. Mm. David That's wasn't powerful. ready to govern. He wasn't ready to lead. And God says, I have to shape and mold you through the fire so that you are ready to lead my people. Mm. This is how you make a king. Come on. Only through the fire. Zechariah comes to mind. Zechariah chapter 13. Zechariah chapter 13. In speaking of God's last day remnant, mm -hmm. notice what it says. First of all, we know that a third of the angels, according to Revelation chapter 12, mm -hmm. I think it's verse three, four or five, mm -hmm. one of those. Yeah. A third of the angels fell from heaven. Mm -hmm. So there's a void there. A third of the angels are missing because right. Satan took them all. Mm -hmm. Notice what Zechariah 13 verse nine says. And I will bring the third part. God is speaking about his people through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold mm. is tried. Wow. They shall call on my name and I will hear them. I will say it is my people and they shall say the Lord is my God. Mm. So in the very end, those who make it through the trials and tribulations will not only receive the crown, God calls me third, we will replace the void in heaven that Satan left with all his angels. And so this story just illustrates God's wow. perfect design. The whole purpose of the controversy was to restore the image of God in man. Mm. And God is saying, the only way that I can restore my image in you is to allow Satan to bring the javelins, allow Satan to bring the trial, allow him to bring the fire. But I control Satan. Right. He's my tool. <laughs> he, you know, you know, you know, when you I don't know what they call it when they heat up the fire. To, somebody's in control of the fire and how hot it can get. Mm. That person's God. He controls how hot, because he knows what temperature to get it in order to form you at, to, to whatever he's trying to form you into, and that's into the image of God. Kings are made in the fire. God does not give us trials to punish us. He recognizes when our flame has been extinguished, and so he does exactly what is necessary to relight it. He puts us back in the fire. You know, the beauty of this whole story is the love of God, mm. his mercy. You know, throughout all the mistakes David made, God never left him. Yeah. And even in his worst, worst decisions that he's made, God, God was working out a way to save him. And I like what you mentioned before, God never let up on the fire because mm -hmm. he knew that the ultimate purpose was to make a king. You know, it reminds me so much, just so much in the story that reminds me of myself. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I remember a time where bills were piling up on me. Situation at work was frustrating. And even at home wasn't at the best, you know. And I just grew discouraged. I felt like I was overwhelmed with, with trials in my life. Mm -hmm. And... What's what's remarkable about this story is that when you read 1 Samuel 27 and he's on his way to Gath, God never told him to go there. Mm -hmm. He never sought the Lord. Right. And, the, and and even when you read a little bit prior, you don't really hear or see Dave, David talking to God. Yeah, he doesn't consult him. He's not consulting God. It's as if David is 
being overwhelmed with trials, but he's not communicating right. with God. Through the trials, he's kind of forgot. He kind of forgot. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I look at myself, I say, you know what, Adam? You've done that, man. You've, you've been through trials and you let work get to you. You let bills worry you. And instead, instead of falling on your knees and praying more, you find yourself sitting on the couch, turning on TV and watching movies and things that you shouldn't even watch it. Mm. And I'm reminded of what Jesus said, that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And what was, when he said that, he was telling his disciples to pray, mm. seek me fall on your face and cry out because temptation's coming and if you're not praying you're going to falter mm. david lost his communication with god i've done that man you know i've got overwhelmed with trials man one time i i found myself uh watching a movie with my whole family and during that time after during that time and even after it the lord spoke to me and said what are you doing mm. look at your kids what are you doing to them you're, you're destroying their faith. Mm -hmm. Your compromise is not only bringing shame to my name, but you're damaging my relationship with them. Mm -hmm. Here you are a man of God who's on fire, right? Your family knows your testimony, but now your family's seen you doing things that a man of God should not do. What are you doing? But even in that state, you know, the Lord reminded me of get back in the closet, hmm. get back yes. on your knees. You've taken your eyes off of me. You see, when David gets to Ziklag and he finds Ziklag all burnt, he's been living his life a compromise. He gets to Ziklag and everything's burnt down. Yeah. His The women are gone, Everyone's his gone. wife, his children, his cattle, his food. You know, the Lord showed me with this story. Everything that he had his eyes on, everything that he was worried about, his family, his, 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 his men, and everything that he had his eyes on was taken away. Mm. You thought he, even, even when he lost his home and his, and his wife and his children, surely he's going to have the loyalty of his men. No. Nope. No. When everything that he had his eyes on was taken away, he finally realized I should have had my eyes on God the mm. whole time. The one thing he didn't have his eyes the on. The one thing he didn't have his eyes on. And the Lord showed me through that experience when I was overwhelmed with trials and, and, and bills that as I'm sitting there watching this movie with my family, destroying the family worships that I had in the same living room, destroying mm -hmm. the honor of God, God is saying, put your eyes back on me. Stop focusing on the bills and the trials and the circumstance and put your eyes on me, the author and the finisher. Look unto me. And you know, I, you know, <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. Mm. This was not a one-time thing. Mm. I've, I've had this experience a couple times, you know, <laughs> you're not alone. <laughs> I've had it a couple times, brother. But each time the Lord calls me back. Mm. And I know from this story that I have to encourage myself in God. And that's the thing, if there's one thing that we can see, it's just how faithful God is, even yeah. in the light of our own unfaithfulness. Yeah. And so if I had to end this little talk that we have, it's to never cease to encourage yourself in God. Never cease to claim his promises. Never cease that communication with Jesus. And never take your eyes off of him. Never take your eyes off of him. He that hath an ear, let him hear. And you've just heard our latest show. If you'd like to hear more or hearken back to a previous episode, you can find us at whythedidthat.org. Please also subscribe to our show at Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. You can follow us on your favorite social media accounts, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at Why They Did That. We're on YouTube now as well, where you can actually watch this episode instead of just listening to it. So make sure you check that out. And this show was produced by the great and marvelous Christian Freed. Once again, I'm Dean Cullinane, and you're listening to Why They Did That. <laughs>